on episode 84 of Wrestling Changed My Life with Tommy Rollins. You know, I mean, yeah, you're, 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 you're doing a lot of self-talk. And, you know, when I wrestled my best, the most important matches of my life, the greatest calming uh, self-talk I ever had was to reflect on my preparation and all the things that I had done to get to that point. And, you know, when you wrestle your best, and you ask yourself the question, did I do what I needed to do? Have I prepared? Have I put in the time? Have I, have I, have I mastered the techniques I need to master? Have I trained at the level I need to train at? Have I lived a good lifestyle? Have I ate the right foods? Have I got the proper rest? You know, when you can, when you can check the box, yes, to all those questions, that's the, that's the greatest likelihood of having a belief system in yourself. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Welcome back to the show, folks. It's Ryan Warner with Wrestling Changed My Life. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have an outstanding guest for you today, one I've been wanting to get on the show for quite some time. It's Tommy Rollins, T. Rowe. For those of you living under a rock, Tommy was a three-time NCAA finalist, two-time champ. He was also a member of the 2007 World Team, and he's the co-founder of Rudis. In this episode, we talk about Tommy growing up in a household where three of his sisters were also D1 athletes. We dive into what he learned from Russ Hellickson, obviously his battles with the Bear Steve Mako, and then some behind the scenes as to how Rudis got started and his involvement there. Really enjoyed the conversation. Hope you do as well, per use. Now, fan of the week time, and it goes to my good friend Brian Johnson on Twitter. That's Brian J. Shytown on Twitter, giving us a shout-out. Appreciate the love, Brian. Keep on keeping on, baby. And if you're in Chicago, let's grab a beer soon. Last but not least, this episode is brought to you by Gable the Goat, which is a podcast documentary that I directed and produced. But it's been a while since we've talked about it. It's one of my favorite projects I've ever done, and you can find it in this same thread on whatever app you're using in between episodes 74 and 75. And I'm mentioning it now because I just started work on part two last night, so things are in motion. I'm excited again about podcast documentaries. It took me a couple weeks to, uh, to kind of get part one out of my system, and now we're ready for part two. And this is just the beginning. I have so many ideas of, of little series, docu-series we're going to do down the road. Part two of Gable the Goat will be live in probably mid to late January. But in the meantime, go back, listen to part one. It's in between episodes 74 and 75. Now that's it, folks. Let's give it up for Tommy, Mr. Rudis Rollins. Tommy Rollins, T. Rowe, we're here. We finally done it, man. Thanks for taking some time today. No problem. Thank you, Ryan, for having me. Really appreciate it. Look forward to visiting with you. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many places we could start. I was an avid listener of the T-Row and Funky show and was heartbroken to hear it went off the air, and I've listened to a lot of those. <laughs> so, um, I did want to start, though, with, with your family because I was um, surprised to hear that all, all of your siblings competed D1. Obviously, you were at the D1 level, but let's start with your parents. Were they athletes, and were they like hard drivers of parents? Or, like, how, did they, how did they produce four athletic specimens that all went D1 like that? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's, um, you know, my, my parents weren't, um, you know, highly touted, successful athletes, but my dad um, was very into sports as a high school kid and, and wrestled at Ohio University. Uh, for a couple years and really took an affinity for the sport of wrestling. But more than anything, my parents both, my mother and my father, 
uh, shared a mutual interest in using athletics as a platform to to raise their kids and and teach them about life. And so, um, you know, they made a choice. Perhaps they saw some gifts in my sisters and myself to where maybe it was appropriate to teach us about life and something that we had um, some skill or talent in. And so uh, from there, you know, athletics was used as a platform for us to learn how to set goals, learn how to be in, uh, accountable and, and learn a lot, all the merits of, 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 of life that you can take away from athletics. And so um, that's really where everything came from. It wasn't necessarily that they were Olympic anything or professional sports or anything like that. It was just more more of just uh, having an affinity for athletics as a platform to raise their kids. And it seems like they got you to really enjoy the sport versus making it a job at age 12. I, I know you have some opinions on that, and I, I really agree with mo- all of those really yeah. about how that this focusing on one sport and all these elite academies it's kind of crazy it doesn't seem like that's the way you were brought up at all no no I, I wasn't I mean I I will tell you that um we never did anything recreationally so it wasn't like I was raised in a family where um your best effort didn't matter or or anything like that I mean we were we were accountable to putting forth our best effort and and focusing and giving giving our best self, pouring ourselves out there and whatever it is that we were doing, but in the same breath, the outcome or the result was was quite honestly very secondary to to just being the best version of yourself that you could be. And so, with that, you know, you 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 can learn that across multiple sports. Uh, you can be exposed to different people, different uh, coaches, different ways to look at a game. That's an individual sport, team sport, whatever it is. And so, you know, I think that multidimensional developmental aspect uh, at the youth level is important. And I think it was important to my parents that we just got a taste of everything. Uh, of course, you know, as you get older, perhaps you make a conscious choice to focus on one thing or the other. But that's more, more or less driven by the kid or the athlete, not necessarily the parents. And so my mom and dad uh, had us involved in everything. I think they put some miles on their cars and and had a lot of had a lot of late dinners during the week and things like that because of it but um you know I'm thankful for that and I know that my three younger sisters are as well that we were just uh brought up uh that way and and I think we're better for it uh as adults. Yeah, you look back on it now and even with my own mom, you know, she was raising my brother and I, it's like the amount of times that she didn't get to have dinner or <laughs> would just spend every weekend in the gym. Right. Now you look back and you realize how much of a commitment it was. Um, when did wrestling become all consuming for you? You know, it's funny. I, um, I, I've been asked that before and you know, wrestling was something that I definitely enjoyed, uh, right away. But I also, uh, like any kid, quite honestly, I, I was almost in turmoil too with with the sport at the same time that I liked it a lot because I was trying to interpret individual failure, right? Trying to interpret, uh, you know, someone attacking you, basically physically assaulting you, and you have to assault them back. And so, you know, there's it's kind of a love hate relationship when you first started out, um, and then as you grow, you hit puberty, you, know, you learn that uh, there's a, there's a game within the game, and all those types of things, uh, the whole sport starts to kind of move in slow motion and you understand it a little bit more for what it is and you appreciate, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the battle that you have with somebody else. And so right around the seventh or eighth grade, I actually remember when I made my mind up that I wanted to be great at wrestling. I think I was in the seventh or eighth grade. I was on my way back from a tournament in West Virginia. It could have been Pennsylvania, but it was a long road trip. And it was in the evening, and I, I wrestled bad that day. I think I went one and two or zero oh and two. But I remember consciously making the choice uh, that I wanted to be great at wrestling. I was gonna uh, put my time and energy and, and my emotion all into that sport, and it became a really high priority for me in, in my life. And, and that's a pretty young age, I think, to come to that determination. Now I didn't know the type of success that I was gonna have or not have. But I just knew in my heart that it was going to be something that was very, very important to me. And I shared it with my dad on the way home. I just said, you know, I love wrestling. And um, this is something I want to be great at. And my dad remembers that moment, too, which is kind of cool to reflect on. You know, we talk about it once every couple of years. And and, um, 
you know, from that point moving forward, I don't think it's ironic that I was making those types of individual choices at the same time that, you know, you're in your pre-adolescent or adolescent years where you're starting to gain independence and starting to want to maybe, maybe stand for something. And, um, so, you know, while all that's happening, you know, I, I found wrestling in a, in a different way that I had, uh, prior to that. And it became pretty darn important to me at that point. How did your actions or your trainings change after you made that decision? You know, I I don't know that it really changed uh, in the winter because, like I said, we never really did any sport recre- recreationally. Um, in the same time, we weren't we weren't wrestling twelve months a year. We weren't doing my sisters weren't doing softball or soccer twelve months a year. So whatever we did, we did it hard, but we transitioned to the next thing. If that mm-hmm. makes sense, and so I would say that my approach and my demeanor and and anything that I did never really changed. I just did it, you know, ten or eleven months a year instead of five. And so it became something that, you know, became uh, more than just a sport. It became, you know, a craft for me or, or a way of life, um, you know, like our, like the clothing company I'm a part of had a uh, tagline. So, you know, that's just when uh, you know, it, it became, you know, it really honestly did consume my thoughts, maybe sometimes in an unhealthy way. But nonetheless, it was something that was very important to me in my life at that time. Yeah, that's such a young age to make that decision. And I honestly didn't think it would be that young. When I asked you that, and then one thing I could not find, Mr. Rollins, was your your high school stats. Uh, how did you do in high school? Uh, high school, I was uh, I was a two time state champion. Um, I wanted to be a four timer. That was my goal. Looking back on it, I probably wasn't ready and wouldn't have won a four t- four state titles had I wrestled even perfectly. But I qualified as a freshman, was third as a sophomore. Um, Lost a heartbreaker in the semis, and then uh, went on to win two state titles at Bishop Reedy in Columbus, and um, did well out in Fargo. I won Greco and freestyle at the cadet and junior level, and um, you know was was fairly heavily recruited coming out of high school, and and so yeah, I mean it started off a little bit a little bit slow. Um, I didn't really hit the full stride of puberty until my sophomore year of high school. And so I think by virtue of that, it was very difficult for me to achieve the level of success that I thought matched my commitment to the sport, you know. And so, um, you know, I was committed and it was as important to me as the guys that were out there uh, winning state and national titles and starting out, you know, it didn't work that way for me. But then, um, you know, you catch up to everyone physically or, or you even maybe pass them up physically with speed or strength or power. And that happens at puberty. And all of a sudden, you know, really nothing changed other than my body agreed with my mind a lot more often. And so things just started, (laughs) started to work. And, uh, you know, I think the end of my high school career is really when I started to, started to come into my own as a wrestler from a, from a technical and mental approach. I was just really kind of, uh, sharpened if you will to where i was more more refined and ready to really start uh being an expert in what i do i mean someone of your size and but also to have your athleticism to move the way you do it must have been pretty awesome to see in high school and you know knowing that you won fargo obviously you're highly recruited you get to ohio state which you know I, i can't think of many states where they're where the college team is bigger than the, most of the pro teams. I know it's the case in Iowa. Um, Ohio right. State might be bigger than any pro team in Ohio. So being a Buckeye must have right. been a, a dream for yours for quite some time. You uh, speak very highly of Russ Hellickson, you know, two-time Olympian. Yeah. I mean, what what a guy in terms of his his pedigree in the sport. What was like? What were some of the early experiences you had with him, and you know what really sticks out about your time there with him? Because obviously he had a huge impact on your life. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I, you know, Ohio State is, is a very special place in my heart. Not only am I from Ohio, but I was born and raised in Columbus. I grew up eight miles from the football stadium. I used to crash the gates after halftime with my dad as a kid, and so, <laughs> you know, I think, I think for all intents and purposes, I was, I was born to be a Buckeye. So it really didn't matter who the coach was. I was pretty interested in wrestling for Ohio State along with other schools, but I, I had a propensity to want to be there. And then to make matters even better, Russ Ellickson, to your point, is a two-time Olympian, a phenomenal upperweight coach. But really, um, you know, for me and, and what I needed to develop is I just needed, 
you know, I was brought up in a home where I always felt loved and I always felt like somebody uh, was in my corner and they believed in me. And, you know, I think that's the foundation of, of great coaching and great parenting. And so Russ Hellickson really just continued the, the emotion and the sense of security and the sense of support that I felt in my house. Russ and his staff gave me that same sense of calm that, that I am loved that the people in my corner do believe in me sometimes even more. They believe in me more than I believe in myself and they're always looking out for my best interest. And so Russ was, you know, an illustration of my parents in the form of a big 10 wrestling coach. And so I'm forever grateful for his involvement in my life and in my career. And then, you know, so obviously that's the foundation of why I love him and consider him one of the best coaches that I've ever been around. Um, uh, and, and, and to that point, he just knows wrestling, right? I mean, he knows, he knows how to, he knows how to train people, get them peaked for the right time of the year. Um, he, he's, he knows how to coach any, any body type, but especially upper weights. He had a skill set and an approach fundamentally from a technique perspective that really catered well to what I was able to do well. And so, you know, you add in all of the, uh, soft skills that I think are very important in coaching. And you add that in with just the way that he trained his athletes and the way that he uh, helped me technically. And, you know, you get what you get. I thought I had a great, I thought I had a great career. I thought I maximized myself at the collegiate level um, as much as I probably could have. And so I can't say that about every level that I wrestled at, but, you know, college was probably my, my, the, the closest to reaching my, my fullest, fullest potential that I believe that I had. And so Russ was a really big part of that. And, you know, I stay in touch with him to this day. Sure. No, I, I know he's, you know, involved with Rudis and some, I don't know if he's involved to what capacity, but I see him and some of the videos and, and I, I just assumed you guys were close before we get to your college yeah. career. I have to ask, did, uh, did coach Hellickson ever talk about his battles with Uregan back in the day? Oh yeah, he for sure did. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if they wrestled more than once, but I know they wrestled in the 76 Olympics. Um, the Russ finals. got the, the, yeah, I don't know if it was the finals. It might've been the pool wrestling and Russ ended up with the silver. I'm not really sure, but I know that the score was 19 to 13 and Uregan, and this is Russ's words, not mine. Uregan was just a better wrestler. Um, but Russ, you know, had a stick to to him and uh, a level of conditioning that was very, uh, notable and he was also very strong and so I think Uregan got way far ahead of Russ and then Russ was storming back and ended up losing 19 to 13 but I had spoken to some people that were there and they said had that match been another minute longer Uregan would have probably rolled over and pinned himself he was so tired so um, you know great match you know by Russ's account Uregan was a better you know quote wrestler but it was a great match and you know I think Russ is is very proud of his silver medal because he knew that that was the most he had to offer Ivan Uregan, and uh, he he probably couldn't have done much better. I mean, he might have done better if the match was longer, but I think that he was satisfied with his medal because he believes that that's probably the place he should have been in in that particular year. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to lose to someone, no elite re- level wrestler thinks like that, but obviously. Ivan Regan, along with, you know, Alexander Medved, two of the greats during that era for the Soviets. You know, I know Coach Alexson won the Tbilisi, so, you know, he had the chops yeah. to be there. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting about Coach Alexson to me is that he was around during Gable, and Iowa and Gable kind of skyrocketed during this time, and he was, he was coaching at Ohio State as well and had, you know, five or six national champs. Would you say his style, like his coaching style and his workouts were Iowa style like, or was it kind of his own thing for the time? I always wonder how coaches who came up during that same era modeled their trainings. Yeah, I I, I, I never wrestled for Iowa. I mean, I only wrestled for Russ Ellickson and, uh, you know, under Lou Roselli as in my international career and a few other f- folks. But I, I would say that Russ's uh, proposed training regimen was similar to Iowa's in that uh, we were we were working out two sometimes three times a day, um, and and really focusing on the physical uh, preparation and the physical demands of the college wrestling season. And you know, obviously Iowa is a lot more notorious for that than maybe Russ is. But I would say that the training regiment regimen was par with what I've heard about Iowa's training regimen. And I and and I felt that too, right, when I wrestled Iowa guys for 
four important titles and things of that nature that went at, at the at the critical moments of the season, you know, I felt just as physically prepared as that storied program that was known for being physically prepared. So um, I would say that it was similar. That's kind of what I assumed. I just wanted to make sure because obviously as we move into the discussion about your college career, your nemesis, your arch rival was from Iowa. And, you know, granted that wasn't Iowa's, um, you know, Coach Gable wasn't there at that time, but you know, you're still wrestling a guy from Iowa. So, you know, your freshman right. year, you – did you redshirt your freshman year? I redshirted my first year, yeah. Okay. And then I you did. get all the way to the finals against uh, an Illini guy, John Lockhart, losing right. sudden victory overtime. Now, did you go down or up in that overtime? Yeah, it, back then it was, you know, just a coin flip, and whoever won the coin flip got to pick, and that was the match. So he won the coin flip, and he chose down. So I had to, I had to ride him out to, to win the title. Okay. And obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> but what's unique is that fast forward 12 months, Mako wins a coin flip. He goes down and you write him. Um, and we're kind of jumping right. ahead, but I just thought that was so interesting um, because the Lockhart match was in Carver, if I'm not mistaken. So there's just like so yes. many parallels. Yes, you know? it was. Um, yeah, no, it's an interesting dynamic for me, for sure. I, I was heartbroken when I lost, you know, as a freshman, you know, I, I know that when you step out from, uh, the situation that making the national finals as a freshman is an accomplishment. But the, but by the, by the, the person that's accomplishing that, the person that's getting to that point, you know, they usually have high standards for themselves. And I, I just thought my potential was to be a national champion that year. So to see it and to have it be within 30 seconds of your reach and not have it happen, you know, was difficult for me. And I had a hard time with it. But I realized, you know, part of the reason I lost is that I was never a good top wrestler, but more than not being a good top wrestler, I didn't value top wrestling. So you can not be good at an aspect of wrestling, but also understand and appreciate the importance of being competitive in that position. And as a young freshman, I didn't, I didn't value it. And, you know, why would I, right? I go on the mat and I'm, I'm, I'm in the hunt for the national title without valuing it. It's hard to understand its importance. And then, you know, by the time I got to the finals, Lockhart chooses down, uh, I was already defeated, because I never felt like I could hold people down. I never felt like I could ride them. And it wasn't something that I ever uh, valued. And being an Ohio wrestler, that's kind of the culture of Ohio wrestling. And, you know, I, I got three sons now, and I'm trying to tra change that mental dynamic as much as I can because I know it's wrong. Um, but the adjustment that I made mentally from one year to the next, you know, next year I'm wrestling Mako in the national finals. And same situation, double overtime, coin flip. It's Mako's choice. He picks down. So I'm in the exact same situation at the doorstep of one of my biggest goals I've ever had. And the only difference was I wouldn't say that I was better on top, but I understood how important it was to hold somebody down, to close out a period, to win a double overtime. You just got to find ways to make it work. So instead of feeling defeated when the coin flip came up for Mako, I, I got really, really determined. And I got really motivated to say, I'm, I'm not letting this guy get out for me. I'm going to ride him for 30 seconds and get my title. And so it's just the mental approach was drastically different from one year to the next. And you know, I owe a lot of that to my coaches and the people that are around me to help me uh, understand the grittiness of getting the job done one way or another. And so do you remember thinking that in the Lockhart match, like kind of staggering around the match, you're, the ref's getting ready to flip the coin, and when it came up for Lockhart, do you remember thinking that? Or looking back now, you knew that yeah, I mean, thinking? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that I... I wouldn't say that I resigned the, the, the national title to Lockhart no. before, before, but I, I just wasn't, I was deflated. I felt, I felt as if I was wronged almost because the coin flip didn't come up for me. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's obviously not the mentality you need to have at that level of competition. Um, whereas the next year I was trained uh, to be ready to do whatever it took to win no matter what the circumstances are. And if that includes riding somebody out, and as you know, the percentages are pretty low to ride somebody out in a double, double OT, um, you know, I was going to do it. And so I found a way to make it happen, and, you know, the rest is the rest is in the history books. Absolutely. And God, it brings back good memories, though, that, that single overtime, uh, the right out or the escape. And, you know, you said right. something about Ohio being a takedown state. Obviously, the Tournament of Champions is, is all takedowns. You know, I'm from Illinois. I feel Illinois is the same way because you look at, you know, the summer results at Fargo, they win all the time. And, you know, freestyle is obviously a, uh, on your feet sport. But 
God, when you get to college, you just don't see the same level of Division One All Americans coming out of Illinois, and I think it's because of the writing. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, no, it's it's it's, uh, it's cultural. I mean, it's not like when you you know Pennsylvania is the you know the proverbial best state in wrestling. I hate saying that or admitting that, <laughs> but it's true. And um, you know, it's not like uh, the grip strength gets stronger when you cross the. Uh, across the Ohio to Pennsylvania state border. And it's not like anything really changes. It's just the culture of how they approach it. And when you're a kid, you hold a guy down, uh, you find a way to get out. You know, there is no stalling called on the mat and you know, you never let anybody up. The thought of letting somebody go in Pennsylvania is like, it's like blasphemous almost. (laughs) And so, you know, everybody is sharpening everybody on the mat wrestling in a way where, you know, the second you cross state lines into Ohio, and that state is officiating their most prized events differently, and the coaches are coaching it differently because of how it's officiated, and it trickles all the way down to the youth level. And so you see a penalty for states like Ohio and other states when they go on to college at the high levels, you know, adjusting to mat wrestling, being able to get out from the bottom, being able to hold a guy down, having, uh, you know, near wrist ties, bar arms, claw rides, spiral rides, all these different types of holds that you need at the collegiate level. The Ohio kids, generally speaking, are way less familiar with that element of the sport than than some of these other other states. And so I was a victim of that for sure, and uh, I had to, had to change it. So I found a way to make it work good enough at least. I wouldn't say I made it work great, but made it work good enough, and uh, yeah. Got the job done, and you know, going into that sophomore, your redshirt sophomore year, you know, even though you had lost, the upside for you was huge. Um, you know, you, in my opinion, you're one of the first guys to really change kind of how the heavyweight weight class wrestled. And it's, I don't even feel like heavyweight's the right word because that's the era of like Karen McCoy, Stephen Neal, Brock Lesnar. They were kind of setting the stage. And then you come right. in, and you could have been a college linebacker, and you're freaking rolling on kids. Now, going into your sophomore year, though, this the mystique around Mako, I can remember it. I was in the seventh grade, lived about an hour from Iowa, was huge. Did right. you hear that, or were you so focused in on getting that title back, you didn't even hear it? No, I heard all of it. I mean, and, and, and you know, Mako, who's a great competitor and was, you know, I, I would say that, you know, you got Colat, you got Mako, and maybe two or three other guys is the most notoriously famous high school wrestlers. I mean, you could hear him arriving at college from a mile away. Right. And so I was, I was very prepared for his arrival at Iowa. I knew I was going to have to beat him. And even though he had not wrestled a college match, I knew he was on the very, very, very short list of people that I'd have to wrestle against to, to win the national title. And so, um, you know, it was a, it was a great rivalry got started right around that time, but I had known Mako, you know, we're pretty much the same age. So, you know, we were going to kids tournaments at the same events, you know, since we were kids, I remember he was always a little bigger than me. And I remember we'd always wrestle at the Ohio state fair. Um, we wrestle in this barn with, with cows right next to the, uh, the mat and things like that um <laughs> and it was an all it was an, it was a freestyle tournament in august and it was always really a barn burner wrestling tournament you had the harvey twisters come from chicago and then new jersey like uh mako and damian han and those guys used to always come over all the ohio kids would show up and so every summer mako was there and i was there so we, I, i'd known who he was uh and it's well documented with his success you know since we were kids so there, there was really no shock to me when he arrived on the scene as a freshman yeah, and before we get to that, I have to ask real quick, dude. How impressive and how studly was Damian Hahn back in the day? He was a stud. I, mean, I would say he's right on the. Oh my god. He's right on the list of you know high school legends you get. I mean Hahn, Mako, Colette. I, I know I'm leaving some out, but those are the ones that really pop out to me. That uh, Alan Freed in Ohio, he's a big one, and then there's a lot of guys after that. You know, once I was out of the youth wrestling scene and. In my 20s and 30s, I think Brett Metcalf had that same mm-hmm. same vibe, and there's a, there's a few other guys like that. But there's a short list of people that just kind of transcended high school wrestling, and they were being talked about, you know, by grown men. Like these these guys are incredible, and uh, obviously Mako and Han were were two of those guys. Yeah, and you know your freshman or your sophomore year, excuse me, I believe you went one and two with Mako that year, and uh, you know, lo and behold, NCAA finals comes up. You know, you're getting ready to step on the mat. I mean, I've heard you talk about this before, but you knew that when you went against any of those top guys, and we're going to key on Mako here, but whoever it was, 
you know, the, the very tip top guys, they would take you into deep waters and, and you take them into deep waters, but you know, you were going to get out, going to get out of your comfort zone. I mean, if you're 10 minutes out from the match with Mako as a sophomore, what are you thinking? Or are you trying to be as calm as possible? You know, I mean, yeah, you're, 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 you're doing a lot of self-talk and you know, when I wrestled my best, the most important matches of my life, the greatest calming uh, self-talk I ever had was to reflect on my preparation and all the things that I had done to get to that point. And, you know, when you wrestle your best and you ask yourself the question, did I do what I needed to do? Have I prepared? Have I put in the time? Have I, have I, have I mastered the techniques I need to master? Have I trained at the level I need to train at? Have I lived a good lifestyle? Have I ate the right foods? Have I got the proper rest? You know, when you can, when you can check the box, yes, to all those questions, that's the, that's the greatest likelihood of having a belief system in yourself when you walk out there to, to perform at the absolute highest level that you're capable of. And so to me, it's just a lot of, it's a lot of self-talk, right? And so when I reflect back on my career, uh, you know, there's been times where I ask myself those questions and, you know, you can never really lie to yourself. It's almost impossible. And you ask yourself those questions and maybe you don't answer them with as much conviction as you'd like. And that's when chinks in the armor show up in your performance, at least in my opinion. And so that's why wrestling is great, right? I mean, you, you know, you, when you're able to, to, to talk to yourself that way um, and go through lots of success uh, that's evidentiary of all that work that you put in and failure that maybe is evidentiary of not putting the work in or just, you know, having the ball bounce the wrong direction, you know, you really become a pretty darn well-rounded person where, you know, I've always said, you know, wrestling has given me a permanent unshakable confidence in myself that I'll carry with me until I'm old, old, old and dead. And it's also gave me, you know, I think a profound sense of humility because I've also just failed a lot, right? I've also come up short and um, for lots of reasons, some in my control, some outside of my control, and maybe some a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. And so you just have a great sense of understanding that, things don't always work out and um but if you but if you want them to work out and you want to have the the most the greatest chance for success you've got to do x y and z to put yourself in a position to do that and so wrestling really i i'm kind of trailing off in the no man no, no, land like here it. but wrestling wrestling really gave me that in a in a pretty profound way and so i i hope to pass that that mentality and that approach to life on to my kids and the people that i love the most well think about you know, th- you know, first of all, that what you said about the you unshakable know, confidence, but also humility, that's, you know, probably the most common question we get when we ask people how wrestling impacted their life. Um, Jesse Jansen said that and it always stuck with me. And a lot of people have said that since. And, you know, I've never seen a sport where you get so self-aware and as kind of comfortable with yourself as wrestling uh, puts you in just because it's it's such an intimate thing. And it's, you know, it's really personal. And so when you're back there in the tunnel, yeah, your coaches are by you, and maybe they're getting you revved up. Maybe they're not. But you know what's going on between the ears, deep down inside, is what is what people uh, people remember. And you know, it has to be a great feeling to know that hey, even if you are a little nervous, you have done everything right. And you mentioned there were times in your career right. where you didn't have that, but man, if you are in the right spot, God, it has to feel good going into that. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty empowering, and it's gut wrenching when you've done all the right things and you still lose. You know, and that's where. That's where wrestling's pretty special, or sports for that matter is pretty special. Because if I told you, you know, if I told uh, you know three thousand people that I didn't know that if you do this, if you, if you train like this for ten years and you lift weights and you lift this much for ten years and you eat only these foods and you get this rest and you do all these things and you you perfect your techniques and you travel all the world and you do all these things, if you do that, I will guarantee that you win an Olympic gold medal. I mean, everybody would say yes. But but the problem is is that there is no guarantee, and that's where you know courage and conviction and belief in yourself and 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 valuing the process you know of going through that win or lose is really where I really feel like that's where the gold is, um, and and that's where you you you're able to transfer all of those skills that you learned over the rest of your life, and and that's why sports are great. That's why wrestling is great um, for for young people because. You know, I'm sure you can learn that in a lot of other arenas. Maybe it's an academic arena or whatever it might be. But I, I know that if, 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 if you present wrestling the right way, you know, your kids and the people that you love the most are going to get some of those values just by virtue of being in the wrestling room. 
Well, it's like if you don't learn that through sports, if you learn for the first time that even if you do everything right, it's it might not turn yeah. out the way you want. If you learn that outside of sports, it can be detrimental. And I've seen a lot of people not handle it so well. Whereas in sports, right. I mean, it is incredibly important. And someone like you, where you put your life, you know, your life into it, it's it's extremely important. But still, it's just a sport. Uh, hard right. for me to say that, but you know, in life, like if something happens where a marriage falls apart and you feel like you've done everything right, you know, if you don't have anything to fall back on, that can be a really scary time. And I think that's just kind of goes to the power of, of sport and particularly wrestling. No doubt. No doubt. I agree. Now, you, so you win your sophomore year. That had to be just an incredible feeling as it would be for anyone, but especially against a guy who you'd go on to have many battles with. I, I noticed in your junior year, you had a medical forfeit. What happened your junior year? So my junior year, um, I uh, suffered a severe uh, grade grade five six I don't know the highest level of high ankle sprain that you could get in the quarterfinals I was up eight to three um, and and buckled my ankle pretty badly I only ended up winning like eleven to nine against a guy from UPenn he was a good wrestler and I'm surprised they even won that match um, I think if he knew how bad I was hurt he could have just picked me up throwing me down and pinned me <laughs> and um, by the time I got to the semifinals I gave it. I gave it the old heave ho and tried to wrestle, but within one minute I just I just could not compete. I, could, I was wrestling on one leg, um, and so I defaulted out and took a six. So I wasn't able to to rematch Mako from the prior year's national finals. You know, I did. I, I will say that now that the years have passed, I remember thinking when I was warming up for the semis with with one leg, pretty much, I was like, if I go out there and headlock this guy and I'm lucky enough to pin him, my reward is to get completely undressed by Mako in the national finals <laughs> with, with, with one leg. And, that, and that's not to say that I forfeited for that reason, but I just, I just couldn't compete. I mean, the, the, the guy in the semis was going to beat me. He, he took one shot on my, on my good leg, so I had to post on my bad leg, and I just fell over and just knew that I, I wasn't able to compete. I mean, I, I don't think I could have beaten anybody uh, in, the, in the tournament at that time, so I forfeited out. Man, a sprain is a tough one because it's not like, you know, you have an ACL surgery, you do the rehab, and you're good to go. That's a little bit kind of more mysterious. So, was that really the first time in your career an injury had put you out of the out of the competition? It really is. I mean, the only other injury I've really ever had is um, I had a I had a facet imbrication in my L5 disc, and just chronic low back pain that I had to deal with. But it was never like I hurt it so bad I had to sit out. It was more like it hurts all the time and it's affecting my performance type of type of situation. So, you know, that ankle is really the only, like, event that really caused me to have to sit out. Um, I separated some ribs and broke my nose and stuff like that, but nothing that ever really, really sidelined me. I mean, if that was, if that, if that high ankle sprain happened in, like, December, I probably would have not been able to wrestle till the Big Tens, mm -hmm. and even at the Big Tens, I would have been a shell of myself. So that's how long the spring was in, in recovering from that injury. It took a long time. Man, and that's... You know, those those times where you have injuries, I've heard Jordan Burroughs talk about, I think it was his junior year, and he was kind of fed up with wrestling, and then he had that injury, and then he realized how much he missed it. Is that something that relates right. to you? I mean, were you kind of really getting getting in your head about how much you missed it and, and what your goals would be when you come back when you had that time away from it? Yeah, no, I I missed it, you know, and I was I was the defending national champion from the year before, and didn't even get a chance to, to really defend my title, at least at the level that I thought I was going to. You know, that year Mako was having a really good year, and I I was actually having not as good of a year as I was my sophomore year. So, um, I was, but I was wrestling really well at the national tournament. I was mentally adjusted and in a good place, and so I really was looking forward to that rematch and maybe upending uh, a, a pretty dismal season, at least by my standards, and didn't even get that opportunity. And so, you know, when you don't have a chance to to settle the score yourself, you know, you feel, you feel a little bit empty. You know, it's almost like it feels better to lose than it does to not have a chance. Mm -hmm. And so that carried over into, into my senior year where Mako took an Olympic redshirt year and I had a real good season and was able to, was able to win again. Yep, and you finished your career one of the tops in Ohio State history, three-time finalist, two-time champ. Did you know right then and there that you were going to make a run for the 08 Olympics? 
Yeah, I think I think when I made the national finals as a freshman, I, I kind of realized that you know I was going to be able to have a, a post collegiate career and really make a run um, at World and Olympic aspirations. I also competed in the Cadet World Championships, the Junior World Championships, and the FILA Junior. Um, and then the, I, I competed in the Cadet and FILA Junior World Championships. You know, age 16 through 20. Mm-hmm. So I was exposed was exposed to the national team, exposed to the national team coaches. Um, I was probably in their development pipeline and stuff like that. And so when I graduated, um, I, I knew I wanted to make a run. And uh, I did make a run and, uh, you know, competed all the way through 2012. But, you know, didn't close out my career quite the way I wanted. Um, I think at the time when I when my career ended, I, I think I thought that, I, you know, my, my situation was unique, that my career didn't end the way I wanted. And then, you know, as you get older, you start to realize that, you know, 98% of the guys – that wrestle uh, at a high level, they don't finish the way they want, right? So um, I guess I'm just part of the the big group. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> I'm thankful for it. I mean, honestly, it's a great experience. I used to think that um, a full scholarship was the greatest perk that the sport has to offer. <laughs> um, not, and then as I, when I graduated college, I got to travel the world. You know, for eight years, I visited 26 different countries and spent a lot of time in the Ru- Russia and their, you know, the Russian provinces and Western Europe, South America, Asia, deep into Siberia and Russia. And so I really got to, you know, get a cultural understanding or a global understanding of what our, what our entire world looks like. Um, I got to understand what poverty really means, you know what I mean? And all those types of things. So, you know, honestly, that might be one of the best gifts that wrestling's ever given me more than just, you know, a scholarship, you know what I mean? So yeah. that was, was cool. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had the chance to, to travel the world for eight years and any other job and, and experience all different walks of life and cultures and things of that nature. I mean, being a senior level athlete, especially now where there's some money you can live off of, it's got to be the coolest job in the world. Did you get to go to Dagestan and Ossetia? Yeah. Yeah. I spent some time. I went to Nalchik, which I think is in Ossetia. I went to Vladikavkaz, which I also think is in Assetia. I never went to, I don't think I spent any time in Dagestan. Usually the Dagestani town, I think it's Mahachkala. Never went there. But I've been to uh, Georgia, uh, been to Iran, Azerbaijan. Uh, like I said, I think I've been to Assetia been to twice, Vladikavkaz and Nal- Nalchik. I went to Grozny, which is in Chechnya. So I spent a lot of, made a lot of trips down to that Caucasus mountain region where wrestling is. Wrestling, it's the wrestling mecca. You know, people say that, you know, you you could say it's the Lehigh Valley or Pittsburgh or Northeast Ohio or even, or even Chicago or Iowa, but you know, it's the mecca is over there in the Caucasus Mountains. That's where that's where wrestling is king. No question. And I've heard you say this a couple times in interviews, but you believe uh, Boivisia Satiev or Satiev is the greatest wrestler technician of all time. Did you have any in- encounters with him over there, or is that just your opinion, just from watching him wrestle over the years? I got to shake his hands a couple times. I was in uh, about three or four of the same events that he was in. You know, he's a he's a legend over there, and um, you know, we get America. We, we've got some phenomenal wrestlers. I mean, John John Smith, six Olympic Olympic and World Golds, and then retires at age like 27. Like, what would he have been if he exhausted? What would he have been if he continued to exhaust his career? You know, Burroughs uh, is incredible. You know, he's he's a, he's a modern day John Smith, and you could argue that maybe his career is better than John's and and uh you know Bruce Baumgartner 13 medals you know five golds i mean these are we have some some legendary guys in in our sport uh in the united states um but i think if i had to really split hairs and and think about who was the, just the most most dominant and most accomplished and most technical wrestler ever to walk the face of the earth i'm probably going to go with satiev yeah i mean I do little countdowns each week on my social media platforms where I go like top five right. Illinois wrestlers ever. I'm doing top five Russians by the decade because there's so many you can't go of all time. So the 70s was right. Medved, 80s was Sergey Belglazov. And then the 90s, I went uh, Fedzayev only because Satyev dominated yeah. in both the 90s and 2000s. So it's like, where are you going to put him? So I, I threw him in the 2000s. It's just for fun, obviously. But God, you look at some yeah. of the results of those guys and it is unbelievable. That they... Some of the interesting things, yeah, and some of the interesting things about Satiev, and I think Burroughs shares a, a little bit of the same characteristics, is that Satiev won the won the world or Olympics under three different rule sets, two different weight classes. So like he he had 
the circumstance and the rules of the sport change on him a number of times, and he still was the best guy. I think he took a year off of the world championships so his brother Adam yeah. could win. Don't 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 quote yeah, me did. on that, but yeah. I think that that. And so, like when you think about all all of that, and we're splitting hairs here on the best ever. I think that's why I give it to Satya. But Burroughs, Burroughs um, had the rules change underneath him uh, at least once, maybe twice. Once very drastically, and uh, you know he was no worse for the wear. He still he still made it happen. So you know there's 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 probably a collection of maybe like a dozen wrestlers through the history of the sport. You know, it's probably seven or eight Russians, two or three Americans, and then a couple other guys mm-hmm. that you could or you could argue one or the other is the best ever. Um, but I'm going with Satya if I have to pick. Okay. No, uh, <laughs> no, one, no one's going to argue with you there. Now, I know on a lot of those international trips, DC was uh, obviously was the guy, but you were at that same weight. Right. Is it true that he gave you the name T-Row for the record? That's not true. No, I was <laughs> I was getting I was getting called T Row before college even started. But I will give DC some credit. He's probably the one that made it uh, a common name uh, with the national team. So the national team wasn't calling me T Row. Gotcha. I'd been called that by other friend groups and stuff for quite some time, and he just kept calling me T Row, uh, obviously. And so the rest of the team did after that. And how would you compare and contrast wrestling? DC versus wrestling Mako because I know you battled against both of them. Yeah, I mean they're worlds apart. I mean, wrestled, I wrestled Mako 19 times, so I'm very familiar with what what he's good at and and the things that he brought to the table. I went 0 and I went I went 0 and 4 against Daniel. Um, he was just a better wrestler at that time um, and uh, really just unbelievably talented. Um, I, I think that goes without being said. You know, people don't talk about his talent level quite as much as I think they should because his physique is not as, like, mm-hmm. um, pronounced and obvious as other phenomenal athletes. But he's 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 arguably the greatest athlete I've ever put my hands on. And um, Really? And then he also – yeah, and he's also just a really good competitor. He's a smart – He's a smart competitor. He makes good choices. So you you combine his talent level with his with his intellect, and you know you got what you got. You got a guy that, you know, he was two time Olympian and got a world medal and made six or seven teams. But I I think Daniel would tell you that um, he he thought he was probably capable more at the wrestling on the wrestling scene. He, I I think he's better than what he what he showed. Um, and and then obviously he's a he's a legend in MMA and UFC legend and champion and great guy and. Uh, now, I feel fortunate to have come into contact with him, quite honestly. It's just, yeah, I feel better by virtue of, of coming into contact with people that, you know, bring out the most in you. And, and even if it's not enough, you know, you feel better for the experience. And I feel that way about Daniel. Yeah, I mean, guys in that era, and you included, obviously, it's kind of the dark ages of wrestling with the ball, the ball drop right. or ball pick, whatever you want to call it. But also the fact that now, you know, all a lot of you guys would have gotten multiple – you know, especially guys like Joe Williams, who was kind of my hero growing up, and DC. Like those uh-huh. guys would have gotten way more medals if they would have had the two bronze system now that they do now. So you know, it's you kind of look back yeah, at that no time. Kidding. Yeah, you no know kidding. Or, I mean? or or if they had a two or a two point takedown instead of one point takedown, or or uh, continuous scoring instead of you know the best two out of three periods. I mean, I could go on and on if you want me to. You <laughs> know, uh, be, be 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 that old guy that says we had it worse, but um, yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, you know, it could have, should have, would have, you know. Um, but, yeah, these these guys were, were were legendary guys, Joe Williams, Daniel. I mean, they did a phenomenal job um, uh, competing for the United States. But we are in a, we are in a golden age oh, right baby. now uh, in, Amer- in American wrestling. And uh, it's exciting to see all of these uh, guys win gold medals and world championships and all that stuff. And I really don't see it changing anytime soon. I can't see how the tide would turn – to where we go, we 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 regress back to where maybe we were 10, 12 years ago. Um, I just see us being f- between first and third in the world uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen with the RTCs, and that's kind of a right. You know, I'm not sure. I don't know enough about it to even offer an opinion, but I just know that whatever's happening now is awesome, and people love freestyle right. wrestling more than that I can ever remember. Um, no, ca- no doubt, no now, doubt. Now you are. Involved with Rudis, what is the involvement with Rudis? Did you found the company? 
I'm a co-founder in the company. So Jeff Jordan, Jesse Lang, and myself started the company five five and a half years ago. Uh, at that time, we each brought um, something unique to the table, uh, whether it be strategic relationships or experience in the business that helped us get the company started or somebody willing to put in a lot of set sweat equity and, and do a lot of the work and, and all of the above. So at the time, you know, we all brought in uh, the same uh contribution level when we started it and so from the, from that we really you know uh, true entrepreneurial story and Jesse Lang was the managing partner and put a lot of the we helped put a lot of the pieces to the puzzle in place to get the business going and then he really took the bull by the horns and built the business out from underneath us you know we started with zero employees and you know fast forward five and a half years later I think I think we have around 50 right now wow. and we're we're in, you know, every every consumer product category that you can think of that's relevant to the wrestling space, and trying to do, you know, very unique and special things, and trying to, you know, elevate the sport um, in ways that that we can and we can't control. And so I'm a co-founder. I'm still a partner, no different than I was a long time ago. Since that time, Nancy Schultz has been added as as an equity partner. So there's four there's four owners currently at Rudis, me being one of them. And then the blood, guts, and feathers of what we do and how we do it, and uh, the guy carrying the flag is Jesse Lang, who's the managing partner and president of the business. So he, he owns part of the business, just like us, um, but he runs it. And, you know, you, you, you fast forward five and a half years later, you know, when we started it, I think we all had, you know, a, a unique contribution to make to the business. But anymore nowadays, the bigger the business gets and the more success we have, I'm wondering what I have to do with it, and I'm more or less thanking Jesse for I'm more or less thanking Jesse for 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 the team that he's built um, and and the vision that he's built within the walls of the company. And so, you know, Jesse and his management team, he's got a phenomenal, young, vibrant, ambitious management team that really wants to uh, grow the business to to being uh, you know what what it can be, whatever that is. And so. You know he's he's done a phenomenal job and and I just call him you know a couple times a week three four times a week and check in and uh, you know co- contribute in any way that I can and 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 he he does a good job of uh, filtering and funneling some of my commentary and trying to put it into the business when it's when it's fitting and um, you know that's really my involvement in Rudis ne- anymore and um, but it's something that from an emotional perspective. I'm really committed to and interested in, and, you know, I love wrestling and I have an entrepreneurial spirit. So, you know, uh, Rudis gives me that outlet among other things, um, because I do work for a living for a great company and, and feel great, uh, and privileged to work for the company that I work for too. So I've got a lot of balls in the air and, you do. uh, you know, really, really, really satisfied and, and excited about, um, you know, enjoying, enjoying my life. If that makes sense. Absolutely. It does. Now, you know, once Rudis got in his shoes, I couldn't help to think back, but the to the book "Shoe Dog" by Phil Knight. I don't know if you've read that one or not. Yeah, I read it twice. And so is Jesse and Jeff Jordan and Nancy. We've all read it. It's really kind of an inspirational story that that we draw a lot of influence from. Isn't that amazing? And so, as you're saying this, I'm thinking back to when he cut over from Blue Ribbon to Nike, and kind of all the uh, all the different hurdles he went through. When you guys got into shoes, to me, that seems like a big kind of turning point from just t-shirts and singlets and. Yeah, I'm sure that is extremely yeah, no doubt. Well, what what was that process like, and how, how do you guys do it? I guess what's what's what goes into that. Well, I mean, you know, keep in mind, I'm just a talking head when it comes to what do we do and how do we do it. It's, sure. it's the team team that did it, and I was I was in part, I was part of the risk, part of the investment, right? Because before we ever launched our shoe and made it known to the public, we were we were engaged in the product of developing a shoe for many years, spending lots of capital, making lots of investments, aligning ourselves with uh, industry veterans and, and supply chain experts and sourcing agents and, and all of the above so that we can create a, a reliable supply chain model and create a great product that, that, the, that, the, that the consumer wants in the wrestling community. Now, I feel like we have a relevant brand. I feel like we have a brand that um, – speaks to the merits of wrestling and, and, is, and is an accurate expression of the sport and what it means to people. But, you know, if you can do that and you don't have a good product, I mean, what are you really? So it's been a journey and it hasn't been without, without adversity, but I feel like um, from a merchandising perspective, as well as just a distribution program and, and ways to develop 
uh, the shoe program going forward. You know, we're just now scratching the surface. I think we just now have developed a model and a platform that's going to allow us to really build out uh, that aspect of the business in a way that um, makes us, uh, you know, a continual viable competitor in the market. And hopefully, you know, hopefully we can fast forward in a couple of years and we're we're the number one shoe brand in wrestling as well. I mean, I, I don't see any way. It doesn't happen, to be honest with you. Everywhere I go, you see the Rudis logo. Um, I got to ask, this is more, more so on the business side of things. How the heck do we get schools like Iowa or Oklahoma State or Ohio State, how do we get one-off contracts with the wrestling teams so that you guys can be the exclusive supplier? Or is that so far... Is that so much I think, I think it's. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've spent a lot of time scratching our heads and trying to understand and learn how to navigate that space. But the truth of the matter is, is that these these brands that um, are, uh, you know, marketing to multiple sports, uh, higher revenue sports, they're securing major, major, multi-million dollar guarantees to these institutions. And the deal is that the, all of the sports programs, not just football or basketball. Uh, need to participate on on their branded platform, and, and rightfully so, right? And so, I don't know how it can be overcome, but but what I do know is that our brand is always speaking to wrestling, um, and that is our focus: is that we want for wrestlers to feel like uh, you know they're aligned with a brand that that has a lot to do with what they stand for, and. I think it's a bigger challenge for, for other companies to really speak to the individual in, in the wrestling market um, the same way that we can. And so we take a lot of pride in the fact that, you know, we always try to speak to the 1%. We always try to speak to the folks that um, where wrestling is a part of them, where wrestling is a way of life for them. And so, you know, if you're trying to do that with every sport and every athlete across the globe, you know, it, it probably is not as as unique of an experience or a feeling uh, that that maybe maybe a dedicated wrestling brand brand can deliver. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that you know you're never gonna have that you know like track people wearing rudish shoes. Not that you want to, but in a, as I asked the question, I'm thinking, well, the majority of shoe buyers in wrestling are not college athletes. So while it's cool to see the rudish logo on an Ohio State singlet, should it ever happen, the market is really right. youth in high school, and and you guys are doing a, just a phenomenal job there. And it's just so awesome to see that you're bringing Appreciate that. that. No, it's you. dude, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I remember when I moved, yeah. I, I was living in San Francisco working at Salesforce and I moved back to Chicago and it kind of got back into wrestling. And I was like, I had to call my buddy. I go, what is this logo that looks kind of, yeah. it's kind of hard to describe it. And then, you know, once I knew about Rudis and I, you know, I, I've had Nancy Schultz on this podcast, you know, almost a year ago and oh, she, awesome. dude, she's awesome. Um, yeah, she's great. And she told me a little bit about it, and so I just kind of been following it. And man, it is, it is a, a pleasure to see another company in the wrestling world really giving you know, full attention to it. You know, Tommy, well, that's la- awesome. appreciate la- that. Absolutely, man. Um, last question for you. And usually we ask, how did wrestling change your life? You hit on that at the beginning, so I'm gonna ask something a little bit different. You're a sales okay. guy. I'm in sales. I freaking yeah. love sales. I think it's it's the one. It's like the being a pro athlete in business. That's how I always say it. Um, right. How has wrestling enabled you to have a successful career in sales, or what about wrestling do you use every day in your sales career? Well, I think that, um, you know, first of all, I, I run a sales force in the fresh produce industry um, as well as indirectly manage a third-party, third-party transportation and logistics brokerage. So I work with over 20 sales reps across all those businesses on a daily basis. And I would say six or seven of them are college wrestlers and 15 or 16 of them are former college athletes. So we really try to target that competitive spirit and that competitive mentality from an athletic perspective. And we've had a lot of success with it. And so, uh, you know, this is something that I talk about on a regular basis to, to our teams and to our people. But at the end of the day, I feel like a wrestler um, there's really two reasons why they're able to transition well into sales if they've got their head screwed on straight. And one is they enjoy competing and they understand competition. They don't shy away from it. And so the thought of walking into somebody's office or somebody's manufacturing facility or, or making a sales call to them, they feel like they're putting the singlet on and it's okay, here we go. Either I win or I lose ready, set, go. And they're encouraged by the prospect of doing that for a living, they're they're excited about that, 
And at the end of the day, sales is not for everybody. And most people in the world do not want to do that for a living. And so I think that wrestlers, they yearn for that. They, they miss that. They, they loved that about what they did as, as a sport. And when they get exposed to, wait, wait a second. So I can't wrestle anymore, right? I can't, uh, I need to make a living. I got to support my family. And I get to essentially, you know, put my singlet on and, and slap hands with somebody with every phone call that I make. Or, or, and so, so I think the root of it is they, they enjoy competing. The thrill of competing is something that they yearn for and that they need. And so that works well in sales. The other thing is that I think, you know, even even great wrestlers have failed many, many times. And so their ability to process failure, deal with adversity, and and understand that when you come up short, it, it's not an indictment on you as a person and that you just got to keep sticking with the process and eventually it yields positive results. You know, wrestlers are very, very familiar with that. So, so they're, they're immune to failure. And if anything, failure makes them feel alive and it makes them feel like, well, now I have something to correct, something to make better, something to improve on. And so the, the sense of competition and the ability to process failure and adversity has really, I feel like helped me as, as a salesperson and sales executive, but I've also seen it just help uh, people that are in sales for a living is that they know how to compete and they're not afraid of failure. And if you know how to compete and you're not afraid of failing, well, then the sales is a good calling um, because that's the name of the game is just sticking to a process and, and being fearless. Yeah. And if you put in the time every single day, kind of like an athlete and you're open to learning, there's really sky's the limit in terms of what you can do and what you can earn. And I tell, you know, yeah, no I, doubt. I tell all my friends that where I'm like, listen, they're feeling a little guilty that they're not a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer, and they feel a little left out because that's not what they do. And I, you know, I try to get them into uh, get them into sales. But to your point, it's not for everybody. But um, you know, just once. It's I funny. Start- it's funny you say that though, because that's another that's another good point. Is that um, you know, I've always told people in sales. I've heard it from uh, from one of the sales trainers that we work with. But sales is the only job that you can give yourself a raise anytime you want. All you got to do is go sell something and you'll make more money. <laughs> and so wrestlers, wrestlers are kind of accustomed to being in control of their destiny. Um, they're, they're very, they learn to like the accountability of if I win, it's me. If I lose, it's on me. And so sales is kind of like that. You control your own destiny. And um, so I also think that's another reason why they, they like to be in control because they've been in control of, of the outcome of their, of their match or of their training. Um, and so they want to be in control of their career in a way where you can kind of compute, if I do this, I get that. And sales, sales is made to be that way. Yeah, and if you kind of think about you know, every Sunday I, I spend an hour prepping for the week, I feel like that's like preparing your workouts for the week or your regiment for the week, and you can totally yeah. control what you want to do. That's right. There's no question about that. That's a good point. You know, so, well, Tommy, I know we're way over time here, man. I've been looking forward to this one since I started listening to the T-Row show way back when, and it's been an honor, man. I hope you have a great day and want to thank you for the time. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. And all great things must come to an end. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, give us a review, give us a rating, and share this with your friends. It would mean the world to us. Thanks for listening to Wrestling Changed My Life.